This portion of CardioSource video news coverage of AHA 2010 is brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Crowds of clinicians and scientists are in Chicago today as the American Heart Association scientific sessions kick off. Good afternoon and welcome to CardioSource Video News. I'm Dr. Randy Martin. The McCormick Place Convention Center is a site where the findings from some of the most important breaking clinical trials are being released, and we're going to bring you all of the latest news. And we're going to begin with some insights from our expert panel, many of whom are well known to you. Joining me first is Dr. Peter Bach. Peter is the director of the Structural Heart Program at Emory University Hospital and is a professor of medicine. That's in Atlanta, Georgia. Next to Peter is Dr. Athena Pappas. Athena is associate professor of medicine at the Brown Medical School and is the, the director of the Echo Lab at the Rhode Island Hospital. And finally, Dr. Tony DeMaria. Tony is well known to all of you and is the professor of medicine at the University of California in San Diego and is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Glad to have all of you with us. Now, we have two studies that were released this morning, both dealing with the effects of different drugs in patients who have heart failure. And we're going to start off with the Emphasis HF trial, which looked at whether a perilinone could help in patients with mild systolic heart failure. Peter, what's your uh, thoughts on this? Well, I like this trial, Randy. You know, this is an aldosterone antagonist, and we've known for a long time that patients with bad heart failure do better with aldosterone antagonists. And candidly, I, it's one of my favorite drugs when I take care of somebody that's sick with heart failure. The neat thing about this trial is it's less sick patients, and those patients clearly did better with the plerinone and so, compared to placebo. Right. And so I think this is going to change the way we think about it. Now, the questions that are raised are multiple. You know, aldosterone, antagonists of other kinds, spironolactone right. versus a plerinone. You know, heart failure that's bad versus heart failure right. that's not so bad. So we'll have to talk about that later. Tony, Athena, Athena? Well, I, I think the great thing is they had to stop it early because the results were so uh, impressive. And when they looked at the primary endpoint, it was um, significant. And when they looked at even the pieces of the primary endpoints, both cardiovascular death and death from all causes, heart failure, hospitalizations, they were all significant. So I think on all fronts, in a group with low ejection fraction, who are class two, that we can definitely start using it tomorrow. I think the issue really is whether you can switch the drugs um, comparing it to the RAILS trial or not. Tony, you, you got a scowl on your face. Well, no, no, I, 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 I agree with, with uh, the panel. I, I think we had pretty much hit a wall in terms of our ability to treat heart failure without devices or, or, or surgical approaches. And this is a 7% absolute reduction in endpoint, which is pretty good. However, word of caution, Randy, and there's been a previous study with aldosterone inhibitors that have shown that the patients enrolled in trials are very, very special. They have absolutely normal renal failure, absolutely normal potassium, and they're followed very closely for that. And the study we published in Jack showed that a large number of physicians who then employed aldosterone inhibitors in their heart failure patients did it for patients who didn't meet those right. criteria and can be a dangerous drug. So, so you're saying that you really need to look at the other systems in this thing. You, if you have bad renal function or things like that, that the results might not be the same. Absolutely. Yeah, but these are patients that aren't so sick, Tony, and I think that's the nice thing about this study. Now, you know, we talked about the RAFT study this right, morning, right. and RAFT really took care of very sick patients, class 3 and class 4 patients with low ejection fractions, this may be something that you should do at the front end early on in heart failure and then use the devices later on as patients get sicker so and their QRS gets wider. I think, it, I think also both those things mean you just need to watch the patients as closely as you do. You need to follow their potassium. They didn't include patients that had a creatinine clearance under 30, and about 5 or 7% did have hyperkalemia in both groups. So it is something to watch and watch very closely. I think that's the word, the take-home message. Athena uh, or Tony, Peter raised this question about another type of aldosterone antagonist is commonly used. Are, are the results, you know, transferable or we don't know that? I think this is the quintessential type of question for comparative effectiveness analysis, that that whole program that's, that's being sponsored by the NIH FDA, because you have two drugs right. which clearly differ in both side effects and in costs. 
and have been shown to be effective in different patient subsets. So that's really crying to be tested one against the other in the same patient subset. Peter, what do you think? Well, you know, like, I mean, what are you going to use in clinical practice well, based I'm upon this? Well, I'm still use spironolactone because I love the drug, and I, but I'll use spironolactone in sort of less sick patients, I guess. We'll see how much more expensive. It doesn't cost. It doesn't cause gynecomastia, and I think that's, that's an important that, yeah. issue. Maybe Tony we, that. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. Well, I think also the aplerinone was used in acute MI patients immediately post-acute MI, so you can feel safe that you can use it in that group, with, irrespective of the severity of their symptoms. So, Tony, in the, in the world of uh, clinical medicine today, how do, we, how do we reach a decision? I mean, do we have to have an effective outcome study, or could we just go ahead and start doing this? Well, you know, it seems to me that it would be reasonable to start patients on, on the less expensive drug and then switch to the more expensive drug if they uh, develop gynecomastia. But for those people who are hardline uh, effectiveness, you know, I want evidence of effectiveness, then in this mild patient subset, we really only have evidence for a plerinone, and we know class effects don't always work. That's, that's fabulous. Okay, so you see, you see that we could uh, continue this for quite a while, and we are just getting started, so stay with us. We're going to be back in just a minute. Special thanks to Novartis Pharmaceuticals Incorporated for supporting continuing coverage of CardioSource Video News at AHA 2010. This is CardioSource Video News coverage of AHA 2010. Welcome back to CardioSource Video News. Our panel of experts is now going to discuss another clinical trial that was released today right here in Chicago. It's called the Ascend HF trial, and it dealt with a drug therapy for patients who had acute decompensated heart failure. Our panel of experts, Drs. Peters Block, Athena Pappas, and Tony DeMaria, are here to give us their take on this trial, the Ascend HF trial. So, Athena, since this deals with IV neseratide, tell us what your take on this trial is. Well, I think it's interesting. It was a huge trial, and so it was one of the first trials to look really at safety, efficacy, and I think we found that compared to some of the other trials that there was fairly good safety. So the renal insufficiency wasn't there, but not much on outcome. So it might be safe, but it probably doesn't matter because the efficacy wasn't there, unfortunately. Tony, you've done some, you've done some studies on this. Well, we published some studies, and Jack, I haven't done them myself. And, uh, of course, the serotide was initially shown to be effective, especially in relieving symptoms in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. But then this bugaboo arose about renal failure. I think the renal failure question has pretty much been put to bed. This is a huge study, and as Athena says, uh, there was no problem. There was a problem with hypotension, though. And so we need to keep that in mind, both symptomatic and asymptomatic hypotension. But the bottom line was it really didn't make uh, dyspnea any better. And, and, and so, in fact, it's a negative trial. Peter? Well, I'm going to pick on Tony on this one a little bit because if you look at the data, at 6 hours and 24 hours, all of the p-values were not reached, pre-specified. <clears throat> There's still a real difference between patients in terms of they're getting better within a day. Now, I grant you that in the long term, it doesn't seem to make any difference as far as outcomes are concerned. I'm astonished that this trial is such a negative trial. I've used neserotide in patients with aortic stenosis and heart failure over the last three years, and anecdotally, of course, I sort of like it. My patients get better. But maybe it's because they just symptomatically get better, and in fact, long term, it doesn't make any difference. But it's sort of strange, and there it is. We have to say it doesn't do what we thought it did. You made that statement. Athena sat up like <laughs> you could say she was that. about to pounce Whoa. on me. Right. No, I just wonder if there's a, there may be a subset because most of these patients, 80%, had ejection fractions under 40%. So perhaps uretic stenosis patients are slightly different. Where their ejection fractions are a little better. They might be, and they may be less prone to some of the issues of hypotension and the cardiorenal syndrome, which you're hearing yeah, a lot more about yeah. that they're getting into. So it may be the vicious cycle that is less of a problem with that group of patients. Alternatively, it, it may be that the 20% of patients that had near normal ejection fractions uh, offset the data a little bit. And, and to your point, 
I suspect many of us are employing nasiratide when we do in conjunction with uh, inotropes like dobutamine, and they were proscribed except for very low dose uh, dobutamine, and so that may be a factor as well. So do we throw this drug yeah, away? Yeah, I was going to say, what do we do with it now? I mean, it's safe, but... <laughs> but. It's, but it may not be effective, and it's expensive, and we have, I think, an armamentarium of um, drugs that have been shown to be both safe and effective. Nitroglycerin has almost exactly the same hemodynamic profile and is cheap as can be. So uh, I, I, I would think uh, that in this cost-conscious era, people will tend to use nitroglycerin first before they go to Nasiratide. Okay, Peter, the, uh, the two panelists to your left have already spoken. What's your take? Are you well, going to continue to use it? Well, yeah. I hate to say this on, you know, on like this air. But on the air <laughs> but i probably will but i think tony's point is well oh, taken yeah. the problem with iv nitro is patients in our hospital at least have to be in an icu and that's an issue we can't just put them on the floor whereas the serotide we can give it i'll have to think about it a little bit but i think tony's it's, right it's kind of curious when their chances of getting hypotensive are greater right. with the serotide than nitroglycerin it well is. we don't know that that wasn't in the trial oh that wasn't you're correct uh -huh. okay. i stand corrected yeah. on all that. right well so on with Dr. DeMario being corrected, we're going to end this, we're going to end this panel discussion. It's the first time you've ever been corrected. I know, I know that. So that's right. We, we appreciate all of you providing, um, being with us and this great panel providing their insight. It was a great panel. And we thank you for joining us here. And we want you to be sure to check back with CardioSource Video News as we continue to bring you the latest from the AHA Scientific Sessions 2010.